Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media and the Australia in Space magazine. Today we're joined by Joseph Kenrick, Technical Director with the ELO2 Consortium. Joseph, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much. Very happy to, to be here and talk to you and, and your audience about this you know, really exciting stuff we have going on in Australia. Absolutely. Uh, you've just unveiled the prototype over the weekend, so we're hot off the trail uh, of this. And this is a moon rover and is part of the Trailblazer mission phase one. Uh, as technical director, sounds like you're in, in the hot seat or driving seat, uh, so to speak, uh, with the consortium. There's so much to, to discuss here and unpack. I think I'll hand over to you maybe where the prototype is currently at uh, and then we'll get into the consortium itself. Uh, so, yeah, it uh, you built a prototype and tested it. Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually our, our second prototype unveiling. We unveiled the first one back in December, December which yeah. is a basic functionality prototype, just allowed us to start to sort of put together what this rover would look like, test some designs. It was mechanically representative and really just kind of start the process. Our philosophy behind prototyping is very much just test early and often. We think we can just get the most valuable data to inform what the real rover would look like by actually just building it and trialing. So we then built this second rover that's just over my shoulder and we unveiled at the University of Adelaide uh, this past weekend uh, that has a lot more functionality and is now a lot more representative to what the actual flight rover would look like that allows us to then test full mission con, con ops or concept of operations, the remote operations capabilities, the perception systems, the actual autonomy uh, required for the mission. It's also got a fully functioning excavator so we can test some of those uh, items and Again, all of that is really to help us de-risk these technologies, these architectures, these concepts that we then flow back into the real design that uh, is what we deliver at the end of this stage one in the Trailblazer program. I suppose on a scale of one to 10, how different is this to just a normal robot that might be controlled remotely? Uh, the, the, the technical challenges and the technical differences within the prototype itself yeah, how would you sort of rate the changes and the differences just from those in the normal robotic sector versus to what you're actually doing? That's a really great question, and it's going to be hard to give you a, a sort of succinct <laughs> answer because it, it depends on which environment on Earth the robot is going to be used for. If you're just kind of thinking of a maybe a, a factory robot, um, I would say it's it's quite different. You know, maybe a, a if ten is totally different, maybe more like an eight because of the environment that it's got to operate in. Yeah. So on the moon and in transit to the moon, you know, you'll have temperature swings from negative 200 Celsius all the way to positive 200 Celsius. So if anyone has taken their phone outside in the cold and it dies, or if it's too hot and it dies, you've realized our fundamental problem. Um, and, and that's only, you know, in a plus or minus 40 Celsius swing. So you have to have the thermal management system to have the electronics survive it needs to withstand the radiation environments going through the Van Allen belts that um, will be bombarding our electronics equipment. It needs to be able to survive in vacuum. Uh, it needs to survive the dusty regolith. Regolith is a really fine but abrasive mm. substance that can even be electrically charged. So that just wants to get into your system, cover the solar panels and create a lot of damage. So it's, it's less about the sort of surface level functions that you see. It's more about the internals and just enabling it to even survive and operate. But there are some environments on Earth that are actually a little more similar. Um, and we're actually able to use a lot of expertise, particularly from Australia, for these type of rovers. And that's really underground mines and or some defense uh, robotics applications where you're in an unstructured terrain, you have no GPS, some extreme lighting um, and extreme temperatures. And that is more like you know, a, a four or five on on that sort of scale of similarity. Nice and, and good answer too in terms of uh, the, the scale differences there. And I think we do a lot with, uh, with the robotics side. I think the other thing you've just explained is the multidisciplinary approach that's required for this. You're solving multiple problems uh, at the same time and that comes down to what the consortium is about. And I think it's wor well worth highlighting who's involved in the team. ELO uh, and ELO2, I beg your pardon, represents something. Maybe let's, uh, there's a lot there in the name. Uh, ELO2, what does ELO stand for? Yeah, so ELO2 uh, is a bit of a double entendre. The 
Co-leads of our consortium are EPE Oceania, so that's the E in ELO2, and Lunar Outpost Oceania, who I work for. That's the LO, and then the Oceania bit in both names is, is the second O, but it's ELO2 with a subscript 2, um, which stands for oxygen, and the main goal of this mission is to create oxygen. Nice work. Um, maybe talk us into the partners here, and another question just popped into my mind in terms of the differences between the prototypes. Prototype 2 versus prototype one are they much built the same and it's the technical side that is different uh was there much uh, sort of outcomes from prototype one yeah so we learned a lot about the mechanical side of things and the the chassis and the drivetrain which is all the systems that provide the mobility and the structure for the rover uh, so we learned a lot from the first prototype and developing those and we're really just kind of focused on that avenue because that's sort of your your foundations for the rover we then found a lot of ways to reduce the mass that's another key challenge with these space missions is we have to keep the entire rover to less than 20 kilograms so any way you can reduce a single gram is, is going to be valuable so the new one we applied some learnings um, you can see if, if you look at two side by side the body's a little smaller so that helped us save some mass and then the, the main difference in this new one is the internals, the electronics and camera and perception sense, uh, systems and sensors are a lot more flight representative now. So now we can sort of test the full range of functionality of what the flight like rover would be. Do you, are you getting off the shelf, uh, say a camera as an example, off the shelf space tested cameras uh, or yeah, how much off the shelf or and, and uh, new new kit are you actually building? And it obviously needs to be space tested as well. Yeah, so it's it's always a trade, right? Do you buy off the shelf uh, or do you, you know, put in the, the R&D and the development into the, the components or the subsystems yourself? And that question is really what drove us to um, select the members that we have for the ELO2 consortium. So this consortium was put together for this mission. So we're able to select, uh, you know, the best of universities and industry from across Australia to be able to fill out the whole picture of what this rover is going to be. So we actually got a lot of the components from our consortium members. You know, for example, you asked earlier, just kind of tell us about ELO2, Innovore Technologies. They supplied the power system and battery for the prototype. Element Robotics, they've supplied a lot of the computing and autonomy systems. RMIT, uh, Space Hub Industry and Advanced Manufacturing Precinct, they manufactured the rover, so they supplied the structure. Melbourne Space Lab at Uni Melbourne uh, is doing a lot of the thermal work for us. ANU has been an advisor on the comms subsystems. Um, it's a Uni Adelaide and EPE are, are leading a lot of our testing efforts with their NIST standard testing and uh, regolith testing environments. Uh, Saber is helping us with the remote operations. You know, BHP is helping us with the excavation side of things. Northrop Grumman on the systems engineering, and you know, just to name a few, um, and a few other partners like BIPAC would come in to play in stage two, where we really start the space qualification testing in earnest. So, long-winded answer there to say, actually, a lot of these are um, built in Australia, the components by our partners, and then there's a few commercial off the shelf things that are a little, that make a little more sense to just get because this is a, a class D mission and delivering on time and schedule are um, equal, if not more important to actually delivering technically. That's how NASA sort of classifies missions. Yep. Well, the other impressive part of this is the time. Uh, you've, you've outlined the partners involved. Uh, you know, this is obviously a, very much a, a team work, but you're very focused on getting this. Uh, and you've also got one giant leap. So this is a, this this rover is going to be touring Australia, uh, and so it has an educational and outreach uh, aspect to it, which is great to see. Um, yeah, what, what what's moving forward? What's the roadmap looking like, both for another prototype? I think it may be an update on the Trailblazer, uh, sort of that that roadmap as well, and then we'll finish off with a call to action for the audience that can go and have a look at this uh, when it uh, hits town. Yeah, uh, so a number of things there. First, you know, calling out One Giant Leap. Yep, they are our uh, outreach partner, and they've been running the Little Dipper Challenge. So over the past couple of months, we've actually had two different challenges uh, for really targeting two different sort of age group audiences where they can participate in the actual design of the rover. So it was more of the the excavation subsystem. So this this kind of bit just over my shoulder yeah. here. Um, Big Dipper Challenge Phase 2 is just wrapped up. We'll actually announce the winners of that, um, if not this week, next week. And the Little Dipper Challenge is still ongoing. So One Giant Leap has really been helping us sort of 
get students involved because this mission is is about more than just the rover. It's about mm. you know generating that interest in STEM and in particular space in Australia, bolstering the space economy in Australia, and just bringing the public along with us. So we will, as you pointed out, continue to be traveling around Australia. We'll be you know, we were just in Adelaide doing a bunch of testing during the Australian Rover Challenge. Now we got to sift through all that data that we got. Then we'll be back in Brisbane um, in about three to four weeks to do some more testing. We'll do some outreach there. I think a month after that, we're, we're hoping to go to Sydney and just trying to kind of hit a lot of the major cities across Australia and, and do some testing there, utilize the facilities across Australia, but also pop off at schools. So we were recently at the Hamilton uh, Secondary College Space School got to interact with some students. Um, they have a, a Mars habitat simulator there and all the kids got to get dressed up in astronaut outfits. And we had our rovers sort of nice. driving around the Martian surface with them. And, you know, we're really keen on um, high quality, basically direct engagement with students. We find that to be the most effective, particularly when we have the rovers and it's just hands on. You know, yeah. it's, it's one thing to kind of talk about this, but when you can see it, it's, we find it's a lot more effective. So. That's uh, really baked in and sort of hand in hand with all of our testing where we can kind of two birds, one stone, if you will. The testing is a matter of uh, sort of building up the autonomy of that, of just putting it in, into an environment and, you know, let it do its work and sort of hoping for the unexpected to arise and being able to problem solve as a team, the, the purpose of testing different environments. Yeah, so there's you know a number of different tests we're doing. So one of the things is for sure autonomy, um, and we will just be trying to build confidence in our systems and the reliability of those systems. We have some reliability requirements uh, from the Australian Space Agency that we have to sort of demonstrate that we can meet the mission with a certain degree of confidence. So if we're able to basically demonstrate it on Earth prior to us actually going, that just kind of builds the confidence and that reliability factor. We can also then add capabilities. They're sort of the, the minimum viable mission that we have to deliver, and then some driving and goal requirements that the space agency has set. So we want to ensure we're meeting that minimum viable mission. And then once we've sort of built the confidence in that, add the capabilities as we go. Because the more autonomy you have, you know, the more um, capabilities you start to unlock. Remote operations is gonna be really important for this mission. But with that seven second delay, uh, with a human operator, you're sometimes limited in what you can do. So actually over the weekend, we did an end-to-end -end remote ops demonstration with this rover. Our team in the U.S. actually drove the rover while it was in Adelaide uh, for a full end-to-end -end remote ops demo with a seven-second delay. So that was a really good demonstration for us. So there's, there's that side of things. Another set of tests we did was perception systems. You have really extreme lighting scenarios on the moon. So when you're on the South Pole where this mission will be, the sun is never above about 10 degrees in the horizon. So it's just kind of always on the horizon going around. So you can imagine you get really extreme shadows and it's very just black or white in terms of what you're seeing. So cameras uh, mm. on Earth aren't really tuned to that kind of environment. So we've been trying to replicate that with um, really high energy light bulbs and optically representative regolith and test different cameras and just see which produce the you know, image quality that we're looking for. So that just helps us, you know, down select which one we want to go with, for example. So it's a lot of just try different, two different systems, see which one works best. And then that's the one that we kind of go with flight. Nice. And I imagine you then start putting some more analytics over the top of that and creating new sort of video analytics uh, and learning out of that as well. So again, so the new sciences and, and new capabilities, as you say. Anything for on earth, do you think, uh, out of this? Do you find... You don't have to, you know, commercially, don't have to disclose, but you're finding, particularly on remote ops, uh, that you're taking some new learnings out of there and also feeding directly back into industry. You mentioned some of the industry partners like BHP and the like, their teams are getting new experiences that they can start to apply for industry straight away. Yeah, no, it's, it's an excellent question and great point. And that has been a big push of ours from the beginning. We wanted to ensure that we're sort of baking in requirements for this to be applicable for Earth uh, in the near term before this mission even happens and potentially in stage one since the inception of developing this prototype in the flight rover. So that's why we you know, have worked with our partners in the consortium like BHP, as you pointed out, um, which has been an, an excellent two-way relationship. Already highlighted, you know, they're supporting this design. 
through helping us with excavation and uh, resource management sort of trade studies. But on the flip side, as I you know pointed out earlier, underground mines are actually kind of similar to the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a few key differences, but you have extreme lighting, no GPS, unstructured terrain, in some cases, extreme temperatures that this rover is built for. Uh, so there, we are pursuing, you know, opportunities within the mining industry and uh, suspect to be deploying our trailblazer R&D in uh, Earth tech, you know, over the next year or so. So it's, it's been an excellent win uh, for Australia and the Australian Space Agency that this investment in space is generating near-term Earth benefit. Beautiful. Look, uh, we could go on and I could start to ask some difficult questions in terms of the technical outcomes and the technical design, which obviously you'll keep under the hat. Uh, as much as we can. This is part of the Australian Space Agency's Moon to Mars Trailblazer Program Stage 1, uh, and that the successful project will be called the RUVA uh, in terms of the, the actual name, and most of uh, the Australians should understand that after that went out uh, earlier this year. But Joseph Kenrick, Technical Director with ELO2 Consortium, real pleasure. Congratulations again on your display of the prototype 2, uh, and you're definitely one to watch, and good luck uh, in the ultimate Trailblazer program. Thanks so much. Really uh, happy to have chatted with you and, and got and getting to tell you about our rover. We're, we're excited to see where this goes. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Australian Space TV.